This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. It's St. Patty's Day. Do you have greenery on? No, not green. Greenery. It's the 2017 color of the year. We'll fill you in with Pantone, the so-called world authority on color. That's coming up. And we can't celebrate the day without listening to Irish music. Later in the hour, we'll be joined by musician Dan Foster. He's a fiddler based in Connecticut, trained in the playing traditions of Ireland and Scotland. He'll play for us live in studio. But first, healthcare has dominated this week's news for good reason. There are many questions about how the GOP plans to replace Obamacare. Just yesterday, the House Budget Committee advanced the bill to the House floor. If you're covered by the Affordable Care Act, are you concerned about how your health coverage could change? You can join the conversation today, 860-275-726. Email where we live at WMPR.org. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Now, what's the latest, including how Connecticut residents will be impacted by this legislation? Joining us with more by phone is Anna Radelap, Washington correspondent for the Connecticut Mirror, ctmirror.org. Anna, welcome to the show. Hi. We know that the GOP health care bill advanced through uh, the House Budget Committee, I believe, on Thursday. Was this expected? Yes, it was. I mean, it has sailed through two previous committees. It ran into a little bit of problem yesterday because uh, although, you know, Republicans voted it out unanimously in the Ways and Means and Energy and Commerce Committee, the Budget Committee, there were some defections by conservatives, so it squeaked through by one vote. Um, but it did get clear the committee and is heading to the House floor next week. You said there were some defections. Who were they? What are their concerns? Uh, There were three uh, conservative Republicans who uh, I get uh, they're upset that there are still subsidies for people in the bill, that that not all of, of the Affordable Care Act is repealed by the American Health Care Act. Um, they think that the money that's going to be going to people in the form of tax credits to help them buy insurance, which is, of course, a lot less generous than, than the Affordable Care Act subsidies, um, is a entitlement program, and we're replacing one entitlement with another. So we know the bill, again, uh, passed out of Budget Committee. What happens now? Uh, well, it's anybody's guess. <laughs> There's talk of making some changes to the bill between now and when it hits the floor next week. The president said he'd like changes. Last night he tweeted that it was being improved. We don't really know what that means because, you know, uh, the leadership in the House is under pressure by different people wanting different things to be changed in the bill. So it's going to the floor, and changes could be made by the House Rules Committee. How much power does this committee have with what's going to end up in this bill before it's debated? A lot of power. Um, The House Rules Committee, like all other House committees, has a Republican majority, and every piece of legislation, unless there's uh, unanimous consent, has to go through the Rules Committee, uh, and they can amend it. and, uh, you know, there could, there's, could also be a manager's amendment, which means that the chairman of the committee can just simply put changes in the, in the bill and present it like that to the Rules Committee. Now, here's a House Speaker Paul Ryan speaking to reporters about this legislative process. He's still pretty optimistic. Let's hear him speaking. I am very pleased and very excited. And, and I got to tell you, it's, it's, it's something I haven't seen in a long time. This president is getting deeply involved. He is helping bridge gaps in our conference. He is a constructive force to help us get to a resolution so that we get consensus on how to repeal and replace Obamacare. It's been very helpful. And so we're working hand in glove, listening to the concerns of our members. Uh, So Anna Radelat, again, a Washington correspondent for the uh, ctmirror.org. Speaker Ryan sounding very optimistic. Uh, He goes on to say this bill will now undergo improvements and refinements. Uh, You mentioned there were defections uh, within the the House uh, Budget Committee. Uh, What else is happening within the GOP in terms of will it be as seamless as Speaker Ryan is suggesting? Well, we'll see. Um, They can lose no more than 21 Republicans if all Democrats vote against the bill, as is expected. And, you know, there are some counts by the Washington Post, by others, that show that, yes, they have 
21 Republicans committed to say to voting no. Um, if I would assume, assume, but you know this has happened before, that they wouldn't put the bill on the floor unless they have the votes. Uh, but during Boehner's uh, uh, time as as Speaker, a few times he got caught up by just by the the conservatives in his party put a bill, an important bill on the floor, only to see it be defeated by the conservatives. Mm. Let's shift to how uh, this legislation will impact states. Uh, there has been criticism. Uh, we've heard from Governor Malloy's administration, from the uh, Connecticut's delegation, uh, just how much this bill, they say, will burden states. Tell us about that. Well, the biggest concern is changes in Medicaid, which would come uh, in 2020, although some conservatives would like that pushed up to 2018. Um, they are talking about capping payments to states, meaning that they would take the um, average amount or the amount paid, average amount paid per Medicaid patient in 2016, adjust it for medical inflation, and give the states a federal share based on that, um, which some states say would, you know, just devastate their, their programs. When you say devastate their programs, uh, limiting how many people could actually be covered? No. It's in, you know, it, if, you, if you met the requirements, you'd be covered, but the state would only get a certain amount of money from the federal government to, uh, to, to pay for those bills. Right, right now, the state on, on the Medicaid expansion, Connecticut gets 90 percent of the coverage of a, of a Medicaid patient uh, on the, the people who, who became eligible after the ACA was passed, uh, they get 90% reimbursement, and the state feels that would drop. Uh, they also feel that, that under the other larger population of Medicaid people um, enrolled in Connecticut, that, that that amount of money that they get, which is not as generous. It's a 50-50 split there. But even under, you know, the state feels that, that it would get less for, for those people, too. Earlier this week, uh, Governor Malloy's office put out a statement saying the GOP proposal to replace the federal health law could cost the state $89 million to $530 million in 2020, the year many of the major provisions would take effect. Uh, we also heard from Lieutenant Governor uh, Nancy Wyman, who spoke to WNPR, about how reducing subsidies would harm residents covered under the ACA. Let's hear what she had to say. They're going to be dropped from about uh, $4,000, from $4,000 to 2000 for people under 30. And if you're over 60, um, right now you can get $8,000 worth of subsidies. You're only going to get $4,000 worth of subsidies. So the cost right there is going to be uh, much higher for, for people. And Anna, can we talk more about um, who will be most affected by this, and especially the, the older population? I, I see that uh, Senators Murphy and Blumenthal are, are doing an event today in Hartford about uh, they're saying the so-called Trump care will threaten health care for seniors. Well, yes, you know, it's, it's kind of uh, obvious that it's going to cost, um, it costs older people more than younger people to buy insurance. And that will go up because under the Affordable Care Act, Insurers were limited to charging older people no more than three times what they charge their youngest, healthiest uh, customers. So under the uh, GOP plan, that would go from, from three to five. They could charge five times as much for a policy for a 55-year-old than a 23-year-old. Um, so... That's one thing. And then the subsidies uh, are changed. So if you're, um, if you're older than 60, you get the maximum. You get $4,000 a year credit. But that doesn't do very much for a policy that might cost twelve or $1,000 or more a year for, for somebody who's got, you know, um, maybe a pre-existing condition and is 61 years old. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. That's Anna Radelat, Washington correspondent for Connecticut Mirror. Um, Anna, you know, again, we've been hearing from the Connecticut congressional delegation, but what's been the response of insurers and hospitals in the state? They've been kind of cagey. 
The hospitals have it. The hospitals do not like this plan. They see uh, a real quick uptick in, in the numbers of uninsured and who will go to hospitals, get care, and, and not pay for it, it's un, what they call uncompensated care. So the hospital's very negative on this plan. Insurers are more cagey. Anthem has said good things about it in a letter uh, to the GOP uh, leadership, but uh, an association that represents a lot of insurers, Americans Health Care Plans, um, you know, has been uh, has raised concerns. They don't like the Medicaid uh, cuts. They uh, a lot of insurers have made uh, money uh, treat you know. Uh, handling Medicaid patients because a lot of states has turned over the uh, the the, the uh, I guess the, the processing of Medicaid claims to insurers, um, and they don't like the subsidy cuts, especially those to to younger people. They want more generous subsidies to younger people so they can si- so they'll be more willing to sign up. Insurers need younger people in their health pools to balance out the risk that older people bring. Mm. Meanwhile, uh, we we know through the reporting from uh, Connecticut Mirror, uh, leaders of the of Connecticut's health insurance exchange, Access Health CT, it cover about, covers about ninety four thousand people. They're talking about uh, need for significant changes to make the marketplace uh, more uh, remain viable. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, the insurers before the election, even before the election, when they realized that you know. Uh, they'd have to uh, raise premiums uh, because the pool of people in the exchanges were a lot sicker and older than they thought they'd be. Um, they asked the the uh, the Obama administration at that point for some reforms, you know, some reinsurance reforms, some things that are kind of technical, but basically um, would protect them mm-hmm. from some of the higher claims. And uh, kind of, it's to put it bluntly, it's a, it's an insurer subsidy, and they're still, you know, the uh, the people at Access Health are are aboard with this. They think that if you if you make these reforms for for insurers, they'll be more apt to stay in the exchanges. And we know that two of the four insurers that were participating in the exchange um, are not in in this year. Right. Um, I, in Connecticut, I think uh, you lost uh, United Healthcare, and um, forgive me, but I'm blanking out on the other insurer. And Anthem says has uh, indicated it may leave too. Mm-hmm. People who are enrolled in in the ACA who live in Connecticut probably not hearing a lot of things that are making them feel real confident. Um, yes. Right now, <laughs> it is. I guess a very shaky time if you think about, you know, you, I, I, we don't, nobody knows. It's not just people in Connecticut, but nobody knows what's going to happen to health care. Nobody knows, you know, how long the Affordable Care Act will be in place. Um, nobody knows if this new GOP plan will be voted in and in what form. So there is a lot of uncertainty. Now, for everybody, for patients, for hospitals, for doctors, for insurers, um, and, uh, you know, maybe next week we'll, we'll see if, you know, the Republican leadership has a way forward with their bill and in what form, you know, the bill that hits the floor takes. Anna Radelat is Connecticut Mirror's Washington correspondent. Thanks so much for the update, Anna. Thank you. And we know where we live, we'll be doing more shows about uh, the impact uh, of health care on Connecticut residents uh, in the future months. Now, coming up, we're shifting to St. Patrick's Day. Later in the show, we'll hear music by fiddler Dan Foster. Coming up next, did you know the color of the year is a shade of green? We'll have more after the break. This is where we live.
This Is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Each year, Pantone, which calls itself the global authority on color, selects the color of the year that reflects the mood across the world. It often sets the stage for upcoming trends in fashion and culture. This year, the color of the year is greenery, quite fitting to talk about on St. Patrick's Day. To tell us more, we're joined by Leatrice Eisman, Executive Director of the Pantone Color Institute. The Institute provides professional color standards for the design industries. Leatrice, welcome to the show. I'm happy to be here. Tell us about this selection of color of the year. How long has Pantone been doing this? We actually started about 1999 and named our first color in 2000. And tell us why you started doing that. Well, it, it's really quite interesting in that you mentioned that the Pantone is the standard that many people use for color. Many professionals have known it for many years. And we started to get calls from people or emails, letters, whatever. This was 99. And uh, they would ask why the color, uh, wh- what color is out there? Why do you think it's going to be important? Uh, the, the whole aspect of the emotional uh, feeling around color were questions we were starting to get uh, as many as, uh, as the more technical questions. So we realized that people really are very interested in what makes color happen and, and what it says to them. You've been doing this since 1999. Tell us about the selection process. How do you choose that color of the year? Well, we do a lot of homework. Uh, We do research. The people on the team are very well-traveled. We travel all over the world. Uh, We we pick up little clues and and evidence of what is going to be hot in various areas. And that would include the world of art, not only more traditional art, but also pop culture, Uh, the world of entertainment. Films are very, very big, especially children's films, because they contain the latest technology in color that enables us to really see color from a a, a different perspective. Uh, We look at uh, perhaps a large uh, sporting event like the Olympics. What is the home city? Is that uh, involved in a particular usage of color that will bring a lot of people's attention to it? We look at uh, the bigger socioeconomic picture. Uh, you know, is there is there a particular cause that people are are looking at uh, that may have a connection to color? Um, so there are, and of course, fashion. I can't I can't not mention fashion. But fashion is not the end all be all, as many people think it is. It's just one of the contributing factors that we look at. So then we know that the color of the year, according to Pantone, is greenery. Tell us about this color. Well, I call it the color, the the (laughs) re-color, meaning that it is the color that really expresses reaffirmation, replenishment, uh, reassurance, uh, those things that make us feel comfortable within the environment around us. Uh, It is the invitation to people to take a deep breath, to oxygenate, to reinvigorate themselves. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important because we know we live in a very uh, busy time. All of us are busy 24-7 or have to make ourselves available 24-7. We, we, you know, are racing around uh, doing lots of things. Uh, we we all feel this need, and we do listen to what the public tells us, and they're very people are very willing to share their their feelings about color with Pantone. Uh, they're telling us that they really feel they want to reconnect with nature. That so many things around us are uh, you know are, can be so oppressive, particularly if you live in a big city and you don't have a chance to get out and 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 take a long walk in the forest, uh, what can you do that will give you that feeling of green around you? And, of course, for us, that's an easy answer. I mean, just painting the walls green, bringing some plants in, you know, putting some pillows on the sofa, buying a green uh, a green scarf, anything that will uh, trip your mind into thinking that you are surrounded by green really does have a, uh, a, a therapeutic effect on you. So we felt that the timing was right to do green for, for those reasons. And the actual color is greenery. Describe that shade. Well, it's a yellow green. Uh, it's not a blue green. It's not in the turquoise family. It is a green uh, that has a strong yellow undertone. And, of course, we know that yellow symbolically is the color of hope. So you've taken the best features of yellow, you've combined them with blue, as any painter knows, and you put them together, and voila, you have, uh, you have green. So you've got a color that really reaches out and brings you some of the uh, reassurance that blue generally as a color family does. Combine that with hope, 
and uh, what you have is a color that uh, really uh, talks to us about uh, a sense of buoyancy. Um, it's a reassuring color, uh, but it's also a very assertive color. Um, it's a bold color. It's, it's attention-getting. Uh, it can be lots of fun uh, when you use it, when you reach out and pull it into, let's say, a wardrobe. Uh, but again, it is that feeling of, I want to take a deep breath. Uh, I, I really want to, you know, get the benefits of that color all around me. I'm speaking with Leatrice Eisman. She's executive director of the Pantone Color Institute. We're talking about the color of the year. Pantone's been selecting a, a color of the year since 1999. This year, it's greenery. It's a yellow green. And I have to say, Leatrice, it's not an easy color for everyone to wear. Well, you know, I, I do hear that from time to time, but really there are so many ways to wear a color. Uh, I mean, you know, you can a guy can put, put on a pair of green socks on St. Patrick's Day. That's certainly a perfect <laughs> invitation to put on green socks or green tie. Uh, if you wear a piece of jewelry next to the face and you feel it's not your best color, uh, put a little bit more color, you know, blusher in the cheeks. Uh, maybe buy something that has a little sparkle to it because sparkle always helps to enhance it. I, I truly believe that if you like a color and you're concerned about wearing it, if you experiment with it, mix it with other colors because colors are usually not used in a vacuum or all by themselves. There's usually a mixture of color. Uh, if the color speaks to you uh, and it really appeals to you, then I think you, you really need to find a way to use it. Now, this color was unveiled in December. What's been the reaction? Good and bad. Uh, well, of course, you know, people have individual feelings about color. Some, pe some people said to me, oh, I love it. And invariably, those are people that have a little bit of green in their eyes. You know, they've gotten warm fuzzies as they've worn the color over the years, and people have commented on it. And, and we always kind of pick up on those things when, when people make comments. We store them away and, uh, and pull them out when, uh, when we see certain colors. For those who say that they don't like it, I, what I like to point out to them is that Mother Nature has, has used it abundantly. Uh, if you, uh, you know, we have spring coming up, thank goodness, soon we're going to see those shoots coming up out of the earth. We're going to see every shade of flower. You're going to see the daffodils and the roses and the hydrangeas against green. And would we ever say Mother Nature really boo-booed with that color combination? We look out at green and we see it as a backdrop, and it really is a gorgeous backdrop to, to every other color in nature. So having said that, uh, think about that when you're doing some experimentation with color and, and try it out. That's a good point. I was searching around on, on Twitter to see what the reaction was to greenery. Um, some people likened it to the Kermit the Frog green or that 60s green shade uh, that some people like, some people don't. Uh, but when Pantone chose greenery, it was an idea of representing uh, the nature around us. Also, is it minimalist? Um, it can be uh, because it's such a strong color. You could use it in a, in a very minimal fashion with other neutral tones around it so that that color, uh, you know, makes a statement. Uh, however, I, I do think that today people are much more aware of how they mix colors, how they put them together with other colors. And I think if they allow themselves to experiment more with green and use other shades with it, you know, in the 70s it was all about avocado, and that for a long time <laughs> afterwards became the dreaded A word. <laughs> uh, but today we are looking at avocado as an example used with claret and used with amethyst, you know, gorgeous combinations. The same thing could be said to greenery. Uh, use it in ways that perhaps you haven't used it before. And, of course, the most one of the most beautiful ways to use it, again, is to use it the way we see it in nature, along with the blues. It can be spectacular, you know, a beautiful green meadow and the blue sky above it. I mean, who doesn't like to be in the park uh, on a day that looks like that? Maybe a few billowy clouds, and, and it's gorgeous. So if we take tips from nature and utilize it in our own lives, whether we're decorating or, or you know, wearing it or using it in our professional lives, we find that colors like greenery really can be far more, um, far more adaptable than, than we might allow ourselves to think. And are we seeing greenery um, popping up uh, more than, than usual now that the Pantone has uh, selected greenery as the, the color of the year? Are we seeing it more in the fashion world? Interior decorators, are they using it? 
Yes, absolutely. Uh, if you look at some of the, the themes that are being shown, there is much more greenery that's pulled in uh, to the pictures. And, of course, what happens is that when Pantone announces the color of the year, we start to uh, create a buzz, and when there's a buzz, people will take the, the opportunity to stop and look at a color and say, yeah, you know, wait a minute, maybe if I put a few green pillows on that beige sofa that's starting to look very boring, uh, that will look fresh and new and will give the, the, you know, the whole atmosphere a new feeling. So I think what it does do is to stimulate a conversation. And at Pantone, that's one of our major uh, thrusts is to start a conversation about color. Because if you can get people talking about it, it kind of unleashes their creativity and, and they realize that they can, they can exercise more creativity, even if it's just setting the table and putting a new placemat out or buying some new dishes, uh, something that will bring something new and fun and uh, a little bit of exuberance into your life. And that's exactly what we think greenery does. We're talking to you on St. Patrick's Day. Um, you mentioned that Pantone staff um, does a lot of research before they pick the color of the year. What are some other cultures uh, besides Ireland where you see green as a, a dominant? in color? Well, we do go to uh, Italy every year. We go to trade fairs. We go to Paris. Uh, we go to London. And uh, we are seeing, and also to Asia. I just came back from uh, uh, Korea, and then uh, I was in Barcelona two weeks ago. And it's so interesting to me that it's really kind of a cross-cultural phenomenon today. Uh, you don't see it used just exclusively in certain cultures, but you see a mix of color, and you see the Pantone color of the year being used in a lot of markets. And, of course, the reason for that is that people have far more access to information today that tells them about color, that informs them about color, and there's more experiment, uh, experimentation on an international level. So this is not something that's just confined to a specific country. We're seeing it everywhere that we travel. And I have to ask, is it a required color today at the Pantone headquarters? <laughs> well, we won't say it's required, but, you know, Pantone people are very conscious of, of color. Uh, every day is a colorful day for us. So uh, you're, you're going to see uh, absolutely everybody's going to be wearing some, some form of greenery on St. Patrick's Day. So love it or hate it, greenery may be popping up all over thanks to the Pantone Color Institute. It's a yellow green, a leaf green. We want to thank Leatrice Eisman, Pantone's executive director. Thanks for talking with us today. You're very welcome. Coming up, we'll talk with the Connecticut musician who fell in love with the Irish fiddle. Dan Foster will play for us live right after the break. This is where we live. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel, and this is Dan Foster. Dan Foster, a musician and tutor specializing in the highly ornamented fiddle playing traditions of Ireland and Scotland. He lives in East Windsor. Dan, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Lucy. Tell us about the song you just played. So, yeah, that was a, a jig uh, called The Castle Jig, written by Sean Ryan, a fabulous fiddle player from Tipperary. I was uh, taught that tune by my fiddle tutor in Limerick uh, back in 2012, Eileen O'Brien. And, uh, yeah, she taught me that tune by ear. And uh, that was kind of her special take on the tune. 
So if people pay attention to accents, uh, you don't have an Irish accent. Tell us where you're from. No, that's right. No, I'm from Northern England. Um, I was born, born and raised in Northern England and uh, kind of um, yeah, studied classical violin from a young age, picked up a bit of a bug for the traditional Irish music when I was a, a late teen in uh, the great city of Manchester in Northwest England. Tell me about your family roots. You said that um, you t- were turned on to the fiddle in your teens. That's right. Although being classically trained as a, as a violinist, so why why make the switch? I'm not sure. I mean, it was kind of a you know a bit of a coming of age moment for me. I was uh, uh, left home, uh, studying at university, and uh, I heard Irish music played firsthand by um, you know second generation, first generation Irish musicians in Manchester. And I was uh, sat opposite these expert players, and I was like, I really love that. And so I tried to copy them bit by bit and develop my develop my music. And then a few years down the line, my my mum kind of revealed to me. She was like, Oh well, uh, your, your great great granddad also played fiddle, by the way. <laughs> and I was like, Well, that would explain it. And uh, yeah, ever since then, I've been kind of channeling channeling this uh, this music. We know that the Irish culture, Irish music, is celebrated around the world. Talk about the influence in Northern England, where you are from, about how that culture and music permeated there. Yes, so a lot of a lot of Irish people left uh, to find work in the industrial towns, such as Manchester, Liverpool, Birmingham, Leeds, Newcastle, and they brought their music with them, and uh, they all kind of stuck together in the cities. And all of a sudden, you had a high concentration of, of fabulous musicians, and uh, the music really kind of developed there, and it's still very rich now. A lot of youngsters are getting involved nowadays through uh, organizations such as Cultus. And um, yeah, the, the music's in great shape over in England, and I was very fortunate to, to kind of uh, tap into it, I guess. And we'll hear more about how you went to uh, Limerick yes. to study. Um, but I was curious, since we, you know, you're obviously a, a classically trained violinist, now a fiddler, uh, and talk about the difference. So it's technically the same instrument, but the technique? Yeah, that's different. right. I mean, this instrument that I play was would have began life as a violin when it was made in you know, 1828. And uh, now it's in my hands. I've been you know, uh, playing a different way. So you, uh, with the classical style, you, you train a lot of in technique, reading sheet music. There's music theory. You study pieces. And uh, you know, you, the music is um, you know, you, you're meant to uh, play what the music says, I guess, whilst using some of your own um, um, innate in abil- ability, but with the fiddle style, it's very, very much a, an oral tradition, as in you you learn by ear uh, from somebody kind of sat opposite you, an expert, I guess, a master player, and you kind of you know, you you learn tunes bit by bit through by ear means. So it's uh, it's it's quite a shift in 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 the way of thinking and playing. And I guess fiddle style, you tend to stay in uh, first position on, on on the on the on the fingerboard, uh, but try and decorate as much as possible with ornaments. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's quite a different way of playing, I guess. You played a jig uh, for us. That's uh, right, yeah. How's that different from a reel? Right, yeah. So a jig is uh, in what we call 6-8 time. So it's kind of a triplet time. And uh, there's a way around to say jig is a jig is a jig is a jig is a jig. And it's got that kind of skippy rhythm. And a reel is a lot more kind of a, a driving um, kind of tune, like a da 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 in 4-4 four, four time. So there's, uh, you know, there's, and there's a few kind of rhythmic um, differences that you that you would you would do. Can you demonstrate the difference? Uh, I could play you a reel. Shall yes. I do that? Yes, please. Absolutely. Um, so this is a tune called The Bells of Tipperary, and I I picked this tune also up in Limerick from uh, my fiddle tutor Eileen. Okay, here we go. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. In studio with me is Dan Foster, a Connecticut musician specializing in the fiddle playing traditions of Ireland and Scotland. You just played a reel for us, so when you're playing, 
Is it a jig, then a reel, reel, a jig? Does it matter? I mean, it can, it, in a way, you'd like to pair, like, say, two or three jigs with each other. But I, there's been many times where, you know, I've got I've been in a session with my mates and we, we play a jig and it's like somebody says, like, let's go into a reel. And you can really, you know, anybody listening can kind of hear the hear the change of, of uh, time there and it kind of lifts it all. So I guess there's no hard and fast rules. Usually you put them in sets, but there's no harm in going from a jig into a reel or something like that. You, you mentioned playing in a session. Tell yes. us about that. Yeah, sessions are kind of like a community idea where musicians of all abilities, all ages, backgrounds, uh, sit, in a, sit in a circle in a public environment and just play tunes. And, um, you know, this is where the by ear stuff really comes into play, where somebody will start a tune. There's no sheet music or anything. And then if you know the tune, you just fire away. And then people like uh, backers, like guitarists and bazooki players will kind of play chordal stuff on the background and you may even get a baron player who plays a circular drum um, there's there's quite a few sessions in connecticut there's uh, every week there's a wednesday uh, session at mckinnon's in hartford um, that's run by gene freeman and it's a a, a great fiddle player who lived in connecticut pv o'donnell kind of started that session and also down in hamden further south is the playwright and they have sessions there twice a week on tuesday evenings and sunday afternoons i've been fortunate to kind of you know, anchor some of those sessions in the past and you really do get a good tune there it gets it, it's quite nice and lively. Let's hear a little bit more about your personal story. So sure. you went to uh, Newcastle University in the UK, Correct. followed uh, by the University of Limerick, the Irish World Academy of Music. That's where you met your wife. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So I was studying my Bachelor of Music in Newcastle. And then uh, in my second year, I got the uh, chance to study abroad. Um, and uh, I chose Ireland because I kind of figured uh, I'd, I'd, I'd get a lot of music there. Uh, I was starting to kind of develop my fiddle playing quite seriously at that point, so I really wanted to find the, the true source of the music. And I, I believe I found that over in Limerick. And then uh, when I was over there, uh, I saw all these amazing dancers as well. And that really kind of was like, wow, that's a, that's quite something, seeing these um, you know, just as um, kind of ornate rhythms happening with the feet. So my wife, is a, Courtney, is, a, uh, is an Irish dancer. Uh, she competed in America, studied in Limerick, and now she actually runs her own uh, Irish Dance Academy in South Windsor and Farmington. That's uh, SRL Irish Dance. So it's quite a you know meeting in the middle, I guess, because she's from Connecticut originally. So, uh, so yeah. And that's what brought you here. Absolutely, yeah. I came here two years ago, and uh, you know it's been uh, it's been quite quite a quite an adjustment, I guess. But the music's definitely been like the uh, the common thing that I can you know it's, it's that music is everywhere. So I've kind of, that reminds me um, you know more of what it was like back in England. Cause there are a few cultural differences, I guess. You're both performers. How do you collaborate? Well, we've collaborated in the past. Uh, you know, I will obviously play the tune live, and she will follow with the the rhythmic footsteps and um, usually a lot of this the choreography matches the tune um, there's t tunes called set dancers for instance these tunes have been around for hundreds and hundreds of years as have the the steps and the choreography so it's quite a it's quite a uh, quite a powerful relationship really between feet and hands and uh, you know it's uh, it's a very historic thing as well you mentioned earlier Dan about learning in the oral tradition yeah. how difficult is that who did you study under when you were in Limerick and yeah, making yeah. that transition. Yeah, so the oral is you know a a u r a l, and it's uh, it's kind of just learning by ear, and uh, you you'll have a master player opposite you playing the tune, and they will teach you a phrase after phrase, and you just kind of build up the tune bit by bit. And then once the tune is kind of covered, the bare bones, they'll be like, well, here's an ornament that you might want to do here, or here's a variation you might want to do here. So you can really build up a tune from scratch and turn it into you know, the, the true sound of what the music is meant to be. When you say ornament, tell us what you mean. Yeah, so it's kind of like the twiddly bits, the, the flicks <laughs> and tricks and all that kind of stuff. Um, there's, yeah, Irish music's very heavily ornamented. Uh, it's also bowing ornaments as well. You kind of do uh, various inflections with the bow and uh, uh, quick trebles and stuff like that with the bow, but mainly the left hand is where where most of the 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 um, kind of decoration embellishments happen. Mm. Uh, because of this way of learning, if you were to learn from sheet music, is that frowned upon? No, I wouldn't say it's totally frowned upon, no, because there's some, some great old historic collections, such as the O'Neill's collection, uh, which dates from over 100 years ago, and it's full of music that was collected at that time. So it actually presents a really good uh, snapshot historically of where the music was at that point. So, you know, reading music is, is actually something to be, um, you know, kind of encouraged at some in some sense because you'd be like, well, I found this tune in the book, and then you may want to put your, not, your playing knowledge on top of that from learning by ear. So, yeah, the, the, the sheet music kind of world is, is also quite a, a, valid, uh, a valid part of the music, especially when you, you start digging back into the history of it.
And you trained under this master fiddler, Eileen O'Brien. Correct, yeah. Eileen um, was a great influence on me and, uh, you know, being able to sit opposite her multiple times um, throughout my six months was, I thought it was a really good um, kind of development point for my music. She was um, you know, the daughter of one of the great accordion players uh, in Irish music, Paddy O'Brien. She was actually born over in the States, in, in New York, but they, they kind of moved back to Ireland uh, when she was young and into Tipperary uh, in Nina. And... Um, yeah, so her her father was a great composer of tunes, and uh, she kind of you know she came from a great dynasty of, of of musicians. So you in a way you're kind of really learning from the horse's mouth uh, with the pure drop music. Mm. You mentioned earlier about uh, set dances. Yes, uh, this is played uh, while an Irish step dancer is dancing. Can you play another? I could do that. Yeah, I could maybe pair two if we have time. Um, yeah, so these are two really uh, cute set dancers. One called the Job of Journey Work. And uh, that is a, a hornpipe rhythm. And I'm going to follow that with King of the Fairies, which is uh, maybe a slightly more well-known tune and uh, also in the hornpipe rhythm. So uh, I'll take it away. Here's Dan Foster. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Dan Foster is with us, a musician and tutor, again specializing in the highly ornamented fiddle playing traditions of Ireland and Scotland. He lives in East Windsor and his wife and has a, a step dancing school in South Windsor. And we were talking a little bit about your performances. And I'm curious, who else do you perform with? Is it a trio? Uh, yeah, so I have a couple of performance projects. Uh, a brand new one is a, a more traditional music slanted uh, project called Daymark. Um, uh, that's uh, featuring a flute and pipe player called Will Woodson and uh, a fabulous guitarist and singer called Eric McDonald. They performed as a duo and decided they wanted to, you know, beef out their sound a bit, add a new melody player, and they kind of called me up. And uh, we're kind of on uh, at the very start of the journey, but we've got a few performances up in Vermont, and we're getting a big November tour sorted where we'll probably hit most of the uh, the, the predictable places, Boston, New York, Washington, Connecticut, and uh, things like that, really. Um, I also play um, in a group, a uh, kind of more in the song-based Irish tradition called Alehounds, and uh, that's with Sean Conlon, Chops McCartney, and Rob Blaney. We kind of base more in the New Haven area, so there's plenty of uh, plenty of fun to be had with that music. And then uh, on a one-off, I'm actually playing with a, a group called Executive Session. Uh, that's uh, Michael Skip McKinley's uh, performance project, fabulous flute player down in Stonington, who was a Boston stalwart of the scene uh, for for quite a number of years. So uh, so yeah, I'm always trying to keep busy. And then on, on a slightly different route, I also play with the Gypsy Folk Swing outfit called Caravan of Thieves, uh, which are based out of Bridgeport. And uh, I have a couple of tours lined up in Michigan in May and then Tennessee and North Carolina in June. So uh, trying to keep busy, I guess. It sounds like you're busy. <laughs> yes, 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 absolutely. <laughs> and you also teach. So tell yes. us about how you, you know, how, how you teach young students or adults in this, uh, this tradition. Yeah, so I, t I teach all ages and abilities. And um, I really try and test to see how, how the student responds to learning by ear uh, once, once they're kind of, you know, their, uh, the basic techniques and stuff are sorted out. I try and get, if they're starting from scratch, I get them kind of learning a little bit down the classical route, um, you know, with the techniques and sheet music and theory and things. 
But, uh, you know, to really project the uh, authenticity of the music, I like to kind of, you know, just teach them tunes bit by bit and see how they see how they respond. And it's not easy. It really isn't. Um, but uh, I was actually awarded a, a grant from a, a, a collaboration between the Connecticut Historical Society, uh, Massachusetts Cultural Council and a prominent folklorist in Rhode Island. And they granted me uh, funds to teach an out of state fiddle apprentice. So I have a guy come from Greenfield, Mass, down to the studio. And it's just one on one. And uh, I, I'm passing on the Irish music there as well. So there's uh, plenty of teaching uh, to be done. And it's, uh, you know, and I, it's great to kind of see them come back to the next lesson with the tune pretty much intact. And then I'll be like, well, time to add some more embellishments or try a new tune and things like that. How, how different is the music scene here in Connecticut in the States to, say, Ireland? Oh, well, I mean, it's, you know, numerically, um, you know, there's many, many people that play music, Irish music, in, in, in especially in the eastern uh, coastline, Boston, New York are great hubs for it. Uh, Connecticut has a, has a good scene too. You know, we're slightly more spread out, I guess, but, uh, you know, we kind of converge and play music together and that's kind of part of the strength of it. I guess being in Ireland there's um there's been there's been movements for many, many, many decades to really keep the music going, especially in the youth uh, sector. So you know, there was a great revival uh in the fifties and sixties and you know there's it's a really quite rich tradition over in Ireland. Um, you know, it's 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 can't really be matched, I guess. <laughs> we just have a couple more minutes. I am curious about um, how people respond to you as an Englishman playing uh, the Irish fiddle. It's pretty funny. I mean, when they see me, I guess they see the red hair and they're like, "Well, yeah, you must be somewhat." And I'm like, "Yeah, you know, it's kind of a funny thing." But you know, it's it's, it's there's that there's that word that diaspora word where a lot of yeah you know, a lot of Irish people have spread around the world and uh, have taken their music and dance and song with them. And uh, you know, I feel like I'm channeling that myself, uh, especially when I, I heard of the family link on my mum's side with the the great granddad playing fiddle. You know, it was it was was definitely a, a bit of a moment where I was like, yep, I'm on the right track. I'll keep playing. <laughs> and tell us, you'll be playing tonight in Stonington where? Correct. Yeah, I'll be playing at the La Grua Center in Stonington with uh, the executive session. That's Michael Skip McKinley, uh, a prominent uh, architect and flute player. And then Flynn Cohen is backing us on guitar. Fabulous backer, plays with many bands, Lou Lily, uh, John Whelan's uh, band. And then Mance Grady, a barn expert, will be joining us. And then later that night, I'll be playing a live Lively brewery gig, uh, is sponsored by Harpoon, and uh, it's uh, that's with the L Hounds down in Derby, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. So quite a busy, busy night ahead, I think. It's been a real pleasure to have you on the Thank show so to much. hear you play. Um, before we end the show, can you play one more song, "Farewell to Aaron"? Farewell to Aaron, yeah, absolutely. One of my favorite fiddle reels. Uh, this is a this is a long reel. Um, I guess the long note at the start of the tune apparently meant the the long the horn of the ship as it pulled away. That's a bit of an urban legend, but I'll play it anyway. <laughs> 